There have been billions of individuals seen throughout history, and there will only be billions more. Probably. Mostly everyone has that moment in their life where they decide who they want to be. They stray from their parents' values and make a life for themselves, deciding how they want to pursue their future. For me, that was not finding a backup career option. But for Jean-Baptiste Poquelin, this meant the birth of a new man, a legend. And that would grow to be Moliere. But every legend has a beginning, and we're telling this legend from beginning to end. The man we know primarily as Moliere was born and baptized as Jean-Baptiste Poquelin on January 15, 1622, in the beauty of Paris, France, around the Renaissance era. Though, I will be referring to him as Moliere because it's easier. Now, we don't ask for the life given to us when we're born, but this guy got a pretty alright start. Moliere was born into a family of bourgeois, or middle-class, artisan merchants. His mother Marie Cresset and father Jean Poquelin worked in the bedding trade, and in 1631, Jean Poquelin was named Tapis Tapissier Tapissier Ordinaire du Roi, which was a royal appointment that included caring for the king's furniture. This led to them being able to send Moliere to the Jesuit school College de Clermont, now Lycée Louis Le Grand, one of the most prestigious sixth form schools in Paris. It is no doubt he received exposure and knowledge to theater, among other studies of the humanities while there. When Moliere was 15, his father gave him his royal appointment. I'm sure Jean Poquelin had high hopes for the future of the family business and big plans for his offspring, but some things don't work out the way we want them to. He continued his studies, mostly focusing on law, until the year 1643. He gave up his royal office and formed the Illustre Theater with a small group of colleagues. Among them was not just any colleague, but his girlfriend and actor, Madeleine Béjar. Soon after, Jean-Baptiste formally changed his name to Molière, starting a new chapter in his life. However, as it may be for many actors, financial ruin was quickly creeping in. In fact, Molière was supposedly imprisoned twice in 1645. To escape debt, Moliere and Madeleine joined a touring troupe of actors in the same year. By 1653, Moliere began to write and star in plays inspired by Commedia dell'arte, and thus the spark had been ignited. In 1658, they returned to Paris, and Moliere acquired patronage with the brother of King Louis XIV. The troupe performed a tragedy for the court, but the king and Parisian audience preferred the comedies. The first big comedy that Moliere wrote after settling back in Paris was Affected Young Ladies, mocking the pretensions of upper-class Parisian women. However, the successful production of this show secured their standing at court and with the Parisian public, and in 1660 the king gave them the right to perform at the Palais Royal Theatre. Still, I'm sure the upper-class Parisian women weren't too thrilled to be a victim of Moliere's mockery, and he most likely angered a handful of people with importance. Soon after, once developing political and artistic enemies alike, he focused on themes of obsessive jealousy. One play he wrote was The School for Husbands, where older men try to attain young women. There's certainly more to it than that, of course, but regardless, it was a hit. Eventually, Moliere and Madeleine began to live apart. This is when he began to get involved with and eventually marry Armand Béjar, a woman who people either say is Madeleine's sister or her daughter. What a guy. He wrote many more plays during the years, and some include The School for Wives, The Misanthrope, Tartuffe, Don Juan, The Bourgeois Gentleman, and The Imaginary Invalid. I won't even get started on the uproar that the original Tartuffe caused, with the pressure put on King Louis XIV to ban the show entirely. Did you know only the last of its three versions exist today? Crazy. Eventually, this final version was allowed to be performed again. Unfortunately, Moliere had worsening health problems. He barely made it through the end of a performance of The Imaginary Invalid in 1673, and he was taken home only to pass away a few hours later. Under the French law at the time, actors weren't allowed to be buried on the sacred ground of a cemetery. However, Moliere's widow, Armand, was able to convince the king to allow him to be buried in a part of the cemetery reserved for unbaptized infants. He wrote 31 of the 85 plays that were performed on his stage. So why don't we pick a couple to elaborate on? 
Let's start with The School for Wives. The School for Wives is a five-act play that was performed in 1662 before being published a year later. It's about a 42-year-old man named Arnolf who convinces himself that intelligent women can't be trusted. He's sure that his wife would humiliate him by cheating on him, so he decides to train the perfect wife. Arnolf believes that if women are just taught three things, pray, sew, and love their husbands, then they will stay faithful. Spoiler alert, his ridiculous plan does not work. I had a paragraph written summarizing the plot, but I didn't want to spoil too much of the play in case any of you wanted to read it for some reason. Anyway, Arnolf ends up being technically humiliated at the end because of his own stupid idea. He was so wrapped up in his concept of his own intelligence that he failed to realize that of others. Laughable, perhaps? Well, once this play was published and performed, Moliere got a ton of backlash about how immoral this show was. So he published something new, Critique of the School for Wives, where he mocked the criticisms given about his original play and those who made them. Another play is The Misanthrope, one that many people consider one of Moliere's best works, despite its lack of commercial success in his time. It was first performed in 1666. You know how in Tartuffe, Oregon was blinded by religion? Well, in this play, the character Alceste is blinded by honesty, and many consider the whole thing to be a critique on individualism. I will spoil most of this one. While it's obviously good to be honest, Alceste takes it to a level of obsession. He vows to only speak the truth, no matter how harsh, and he soon grows very unpopular. He falls in love with a woman named Selimane that is the epitome of the courtly manners that he despises in all of humanity. He always reprimands her, but she refuses to change. He ends up finding out that he's been completely led on by her after being humiliated and resorting to a self-imposed exile for refusing to give false compliments in a trial. Gotta love that honesty. He then exiles himself from society because she wouldn't leave with him, and he refuses to be flexible and think about anyone but himself. How dramatic. The difference with this play is that Moliere focuses more on the development of character rather than the progression of the plot. Many farces of the time, including many of Moliere's, resorted to the caricatures of traditional social satire. The misanthrope as a whole mostly satirizes the hypocrisies of French aristocracy, but also points out flaws present in all humans, and Moliere presents this by making strong character dynamics. Of course, these are very much watered-down descriptions of the plays. I could take a whole presentation just talking about one, with the plot, the characters, and the themes. And after all, these are just two of his plays. So, what even made him so popular, and why is he still relevant today? Well, for one, he often completely ignored the rules of neoclassicism. For example, in neoclassical plays, good manners and morality were essential. Comedies were supposed to end happily, and plays did not mix comedy and drama. Moliere did not follow these rules. Mixing elements of comedy and drama is actually part of what makes his writing style so unique and impactful. Moliere didn't stick to one specific formula for writing his plays. He used different techniques, both in writing and in performance, to please the audience while often getting a message across. His early one-act farces masterfully consisted of stereotyped characterization and ritualized stage business, as is French farcial tradition. Moliere also utilized elements present in new comedy, with young lovers and tangled relationships. However, when combining and transforming the components of both categories, you get a whole new level of rich satire and deep, thought-out characters. He molded comedy with drama into a tool of presenting a wide array of human follies and vices, such as lies and religious hypocrisy in Tartuffe, and obsessive honesty and hypocrisy in The Misanthrope. Because he addressed said vices rather than making them harmless to preserve comic celebration, his shows were much more varied than other shows presenting similar themes. His main priority was not to educate his audience, but to please them, and he found that holding up a mirror gave them a real look at who they are or who they might become. The more telling his portraits, the more they amused, and the more they amused, the more they informed. This probing into human nature and the efficiency in which he portrayed it gave him a lasting reputation, which includes being dubbed one of the greatest writers in French comedy and even causing French to be considered the language of Moliere. 
There are a lot of things I didn't get to address, such as elaborating on the close relationship Moliere had with King Louis XIV, the rules and theatrical expectations of 17th century France, Italian influence, more of his work, etc. I wanted to get as much of the information that I found most important as organized as I could to be able to present, but I highly encourage you to read more about him. I had a strange amount of fun researching, and I hope you had a strange amount of fun listening. Thank you.